Today's scripture reading is from Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonia. Thessaloniki is a port city on the Aegean Sea in northern Greece. It became a free city in the Roman Republic under Mark Anthony around 41 BC and served as an important trade hub between the East and the West. Paul founded the Christian church in Thessalonica, but he was forced to leave by opponents of the gospel. His letter to the church in Thessaloniki is considered to be the first letter in the New Testament, possibly written around 52 AD. In this letter, Paul encourages the followers of Christ to be steadfast in their faith. First, Thessalonians is a short letter relative to his other letters to the churches in the region, just about 12 short paragraphs. Yet, this letter, like all his writings, is especially powerful and is filled with deep meaning. Listen to these few words from Paul, which are the centerpiece of our Christian faith. From chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we come before you in this season of thanksgiving with gratitude in our hearts for the blessings we have received and with anticipation and hope as we begin this Christmas season. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be pleasing to you this day and always. Amen. Today we conclude our fall sermon series on the subject of Koinonia, which is the ancient Greek word for being in community with Christ. And God wants to be in relationship with us, and as followers of Christ, we want to be in relationship with God. And on our previous weeks, we explored the meaning of koinonia in relation to our Christian faith, and all of these messages had a rather common theme to be in relationship with God and with each other in Christian fellowship. And today's scripture reading is at the very heart of our faith. God commands us to do three things, to rejoice always, to pray constantly, and to be thankful in everything. And we'll unpack these three requirements in a minute, but for now, here's a teaser alert. What does it mean to be thankful for everything, including the disappointments and the bad news and the losses and the tragedies we experience in life? You may have heard this story about the hereafter. Comedian Tim Conway confessed that as he approached old age, he'd been spending a lot of time thinking about the hereafter. And so he said, in fact, now every time I walk into a room, I wonder what I am here after. I don't know if you've had that experience, but I certainly have. Now, in the verses that uh, Julie read to us this morning, Paul reminds us that God expects three things from us, and the first is to rejoice. What's it mean to rejoice? It's kind of a peculiar term in a way. And why does God command us to rejoice always? Well, when things are going well, when we find ourselves happy and content, uh, at peace, it's, it's pretty easy to find joy in life and rejoice. And rejoice means to celebrate with joy. Now, the term rejoice was commonly used among early Christians. It was a call to joy and was often used as a salutation or greeting. 
Sometimes Jesus would walk into a room and immediately call people to rejoice instead of using the standard greeting of hello. Of course, joy is more than just happiness. Jesus wasn't calling people to sing or dance or laugh or just have fun. And when we rejoice, we express our love of God. We express our relationship with God through our thoughts, what we think ourselves, and through our words, what we say, and through our actions, what we do. And what we think and say and do are examples of our rejoicing in the Lord, and what we think and say and do demonstrates our relationship with God. And so to command Christians to rejoice under difficult circumstances is pretty hard for us to understand at least without a context. We can understand why people who are facing hardship or difficulties uh, need to pray to seek the grace of God to sustain them during their difficulties. We can also understand why we should give continual thanks for the blessings we receive from a loving God. But why must we rejoice during times of difficulty, during times of suffering and challenges in this life? And I think the answer is found by looking to the future and the eternal life promised to every Christian. Times of trial and suffering will give way to the blessings that Jesus has promised each of us. So it is easy to rejoice in good times, but rejoicing in times of difficulty is frankly very hard to do. And rejoicing in times of difficulty is not some meaningless religious ritual in which we focus on how we feel or in which we resolve to be brave in the face of difficulty. Instead, by rejoicing in times of difficulty, we're following the example set by Jesus in his own life, death, and resurrection. Suffering trials and tribulations of life give way to the resurrection of our bodies, to our future glory, and to eternal life. And Christians can rejoice in the midst of suffering because of Jesus, who secured and now guarantees a future of joy for those whom he redeems. And so God commands us to rejoice always, not sometimes, and not just in good times, but in bad times too. Because by rejoicing always, we are placing our relationship with God first, above all and beyond our own personal interests. And when we rejoice, we replace worry with trust in God. The Apostle Paul tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always, because when we place our trust in God, then we do not need to worry about anything. Tell God what you need and thank God for all that he has done. The second commandment in the scripture is to pray without ceasing. And what does that mean, to pray without ceasing? It means we should never stop praying. It means our constant conversation partner is God. It means we are constantly talking with God in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. And like rejoicing always, we are called to pray constantly, not just when convenient or necessary, but without ceasing. And it's easy to pray when times are good and to give thanks. It's also easy to pray when times are bad and to seek God's help. But praying constantly means that we are praying to God in both good times and in bad times. Again, by praying without ceasing, we are putting our relationship with God first above all else. And in so doing, we are following the example that Jesus gave to us. Jesus prayed constantly. He prayed when he was with his disciples. He prayed when he performed miracles. He prayed before his sermons. He prayed for his disciples. And he prayed for others, including those he had never met. And he prayed when he was alone. So many references in the Bible recount the moments when Jesus left the work of his ministry and the presence of his disciples and went to a quiet place to pray alone to God. 
And Jesus not only prayed in good times, but Jesus prayed in bad times too. We recall that Jesus prayed in every circumstance when he was facing a trial or difficulty. He prayed in the garden before his arrest, torture, and persecution. He prayed at the Last Supper when he knew he would be betrayed. And he prayed to God on the cross, and before he took his last breath, he prayed for us, and he prayed for God to forgive us. Jesus prayed ceaselessly, and so should we. And the final command in the scripture is to be thankful for everything. And giving thanks to God in all things, all things is probably the most difficult of these three commands. Oh, it's, it's kind of easy to give thanks. We do it all the time. We give thanks before our meals. We say thank you to each other frequently for kind gestures to express our appreciation to one another. Most of us prayed at our Thanksgiving gatherings uh, this, this weekend, and we, we gave thanks for the many blessings we enjoy. Thanks for the gathering. Thanks for the food. Thanks for the fellowship. Thanks for the presence of loved ones. And we give thanks for the blessings of this past year, perhaps for employment or for meaningful work or for good health or for our families and our friends. And we remember those who have gone before us. So we all pray and give thanks for the good things in life. And even when we have a near miss but a successful outcome, we frequently say, thank God. But how many of us give thanks for the bad things that happen to us in life? Are you thankful for the tax audit from the IRS? Are you thankful for losing your job? Are you thankful for a bad medical diagnosis? Are you thankful for the loss of a loved one? No, we certainly are not. Yet the scripture calls us to be thankful for everything not just the good times, not just the good things, but the bad things too. And how can that be? How can we be grateful for bad things that happen to us or to our loved ones? Again, the Apostle Paul reminds us to replace worry with trust in God. For worry comes from two sinful beliefs. The first is that God's character and God's purposes for us cannot be trusted. But we know, we know God's character consists of goodness and love. And when we doubt God's goodness and love, then we doubt his plans and purposes for us, and we get twisted up in worry and anxiety. Worry tells us things like, God could not possibly be in this situation or God would not be walking with me through this, or God could not be teaching me anything through this, or God could not possibly heal my heart from this. And when we cannot see God in our circumstances, then we lose hope. And if you view this world as a timeline, a continuum, if you view life as a linear experience, then giving thanks to God in everything simply does not make sense. But if you view the world from God's perspective, from the viewpoint of the Creator, then giving thanks in everything does make sense. Let me try to explain why. Listen, listen to this statement. The crucifixion and the resurrection happened before Jesus was born. What? The crucifixion and the resurrection happened before Jesus was born. We think in linear terms from beginning to end, but God does not think that way. God is the creator, the director of the movie of life. So when I say Jesus died and was resurrected before he was born, then that is from the perspective of the creator. God knew Jesus would come into this world to save us from our sins. 
God knew Jesus would be crucified and die for our sins. God knew that Jesus would be raised from the dead and returned to live among his disciples to show them and us that there is eternal life in God's kingdom. For God is the producer, writer, director, and main character in the movie of our lives. God already knows the ending. So when the challenges of life happen to us, financial problems, health problems, the loss of loved ones, whatever, God already knows these problems will happen. God already knows these problems will cause us pain and suffering. But God did not promise us that we would be free of sin, free of problems, or free from pain and suffering. Instead, God promised that we would not be forsaken, just as he did not forsake Jesus on the cross. God promised us that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. God promised us that no matter what the difficulty, no matter how bad the situation is, God would abide with us. God would be with us. God would love us, comfort us, and care for us. And so because we see and think and do things in a linear fashion, we simply continue on the journey of life day after day, year after year. But for God, there is no timeline. There is no deadline. Because God already knows the end of our stories. God already knows how our lives end. And between the beginning and the end of our lives, God is keenly interested in us, in how we are doing, in what we are doing, and why we are doing what we do. God sent his son Jesus to live among us and to teach us how to be Christians, to model for us the Christian life, a, a life of love, not hate, a life of joy, not sadness, a life of hope, not despair. So if you think about it, the commandments are simply a recipe for our relationship with God. The commandments are the ingredients that define koinonia, our shared experience as children of a loving God. And here's the point. The commandments aren't requirements. They're not suggestions. You remember when the lawyer challenged Jesus on which law was the most important without hesitation, Jesus said to love God with all your heart and mind and spirit. And then Jesus added, and the second law is like the first, to love your neighbors as yourselves. And this means all our neighbors, not just some or those we like or who like us, because we are all God's children. And that commandment to love one another and to love God is the centerpiece of our relationship with God. And all the other teachings of the Bible follow from that. Thankfulness thankfulness is humility. It is the opposite of ego. No matter what the circumstance, good or bad, God calls us to be thankful because As Christians, we are called to place our faith, to place our trust in God. And this is not negotiable. When we committed our lives to Christ, there were not conditions attached. We were all in. So don't get to cherry pick the commandments that we like or that we agree with and ignore the ones we do not like or do not agree with. We are commanded to be thankful in all circumstances, not just in the good ones. And it's those circumstances that we don't like, that we don't agree with, that frankly are the hardest for us to comply with. So instead, I suggest we have an attitude of gratitude. So God calls us to rejoice always. And the theologian Karl Barth says, joy is the simplest form of gratitude. Rejoice always, be joyful. 
And God calls us to pray ceaselessly, not just some of the time, but all of the time. And finally, God calls us to be thankful in all circumstances, in good times and in bad times, because thankfulness takes the sting out of something that is meant to hurt you. Rejoice always, pray ceaselessly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. And now, as uh, Paul Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. How do we persevere through difficult times? Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison, during which he suffered greatly physically, emotionally, and mentally. But he used that time to develop his mind and his character and his leadership for his nation. Martin Luther King was arrested 26 times, and he also suffered greatly. But he used that experience to lead the civil rights movement to transform our society for the better. Mahatma Gandhi was sentenced to six years in prison, but he used that time to inspire his people and his movement with the theme, be the change you want to see in the world. Helen Keller was well known for her gratitude attitude. She accomplished more in life than most, despite being blind and deaf from the age of two. And the list can go on and on. So what does this have to do with thankfulness? Well, when we face the challenges in life, and we will, then we need to make a choice about how we are going to go forward. How do we respond when those challenges arise? If we want to move forward, then we need to keep hope. We need to accept what is, and we need to experience gratitude. The Bible is full of stories of those who suffered but had an attitude of gratitude from Daniel and the lion to Hannah and her son Samuel, to Paul and the violent sea storm, and to Jesus on the cross. Anthony Ray Hinton spent 30 years on death row for a crime he did not commit. At the time, he was working in a locked factory, but he was convicted on false testimony and because he was black. He spent his 30 years in solitary confinement in a five-foot by seven-foot cell, and he was allowed out of his cell only one hour per day during those 30 years. And yet in that one hour, he became a friend to the other inmates and to the prison guards, many of whom went to bat for him and urged attorneys to help get him out. 30 years later, the unanimous Supreme Court ruled that he was falsely accused and convicted, and they ordered Hinton's immediate release from jail. In an interview on 60 Minutes, Hinton was asked if he was angry at the people who put him in jail. He said he forgave them all. And the interviewer responded, but they took 30 years of your life. How can you not be angry? And Hinton responded, if I am angry and unforgiven, then they will have taken away the rest of my life. And he went on to say, the world didn't give you your joy, and the world cannot take it away. You can let people come into your life and destroy it, but I refuse to let anyone take my joy I wake up in the morning, and I don't need anyone to make me laugh. I'm going to laugh on my own, because I have been blessed to see another day. And when you're blessed to see another day, that should automatically give you joy. And that is an attitude of gratitude. Amen.